The subject of the morning is man versus the machine. If I may be permitted a very feeble pun, our subject is shop-worn. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, man has been battling the machine. He discovered that the machine was both an ally and an enemy, that it was not a cure-all, but in many instances it was a curse. What was meant to be a blessing became a bane to man's existence. In fact, man found out he had made a Frankenstein, that the machine was a monster that made a machine of man, a robot. And today we are in the midst of another revolution. It's a revolution against the establishment today. If I can interpret it at all, it's a those that are opposed to becoming a cog in a very corrupt machine today. And in a society today that has become very mechanical, life has become stagnant and sterile and suffocating. It's like Laocoon in Greek mythology when he and his sons on the shores of Troy battle the serpent and these serpents help them in their vice-like grip until their life ebbed away. Now, the Word of God has warned against this very situation in one of the strangest books in the library of the 66 books of Scripture. Ecclesiastes, the book we're looking at today, is one of the most frightening books that's ever been written. It seems to teach that which is contrary to the rest of Scripture. And the thing that makes it frightening is the fact that agnostics and skeptics from the very beginning have quoted from it liberally. Voltaire quoted from it, Volney quoted from it, and Schopenhauer quoted from this book and many others. George Bernard Shaw quoted from it. Several cults today turn to Ecclesiastes to support some false teaching that they have or rank heresy. For instance, soul sleep. Where do they get that? Well, they go to the book of Ecclesiastes. And they turn to a verse, for instance, like this in chapter 9, verse 10. Whatsoever the hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And from that they draw soul sleep. Well, to begin with, just a cursory uh, consideration of that verse would reveal he's not talking about the soul to begin with, that he's actually, he's talking about the body. He says, whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it here, because when you go to the grave, that hand won't be able to do anything. There's nothing for it to do there. Uh, may I say to you, he's certainly not talking about the hand of the soul. The soul doesn't seem to have a hand. And to give it that kind of an interpretation is entirely wrong. And if they would just read on, even in Ecclesiastes, he'd make it very clear that he's talking merely about the body, the, the house we live in. Paul called it a tent. That he said, I know that if this tent that we live in is dissolved, that's the thing that he's speaking of here, is just the body and not the soul of man at all. For in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, he says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. And that's the body. God said to Adam, Out of the dust was you taken, and unto dust you will return. What? The, the physical part of man. And the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So the spirit the soul of man never went down into the grave, never did, never will go into the grave. 
May I say to you that this is an example of how even the cults come to this book to get one of their heretical doctrines. May I also say that this is the part of the inspired Word of God, and somebody says, well, if it's inspired, then isn't it true? And we need to understand what inspiration really is. Inspiration does not guarantee the truth of a statement. It guarantees the factual truth of the statement. This is what I mean. Back in the Old Testament, back in the time of the book of Genesis, Satan came in the form of the servant and said to the woman, Thou shalt not surely die. Friends, that's a lie. But the inspiration guarantees to us that's what Satan said. But it doesn't mean that it's true what he said. And what is stated in the book of Ecclesiastes is not necessarily so. And I hope I can show in a moment why that is true, because the purpose of the book is not that at all. Some good men today... They take this book entirely out of its context. The passage I read this morning, the third chapter, has been used in funerals. hasn't anything in the world to do with the funeral and should not go there at all. Now, why is it that the book of Ecclesiastes is the type of book that it is? Why is it that it's had this type of an influence on mankind so the agnostic can go to it and so the cultist can go to it and so even that good man can draw a wrong interpretation from it. Well, I think the reason is obvious. It's because the purpose of the book is misunderstood today and it's been lost sight of if it ever was understood. May I say to you that the book of Ecclesiastes gives the philosophy of man who is away from God. This was the experience of Solomon when he was out of fellowship with God, and he was out of fellowship with him a long time. In the book of Job, God showed Job, a righteous man, that he was a sinner in God's sight. In Ecclesiastes, God showed Solomon, the wisest man, that he was a fool, in God's sight. And what you have in this book is a recurring expression, a phrase that becomes actually monotonous, under the sun, under the sun. This is an experiment that Solomon made on the human plane. And the experiment is this, that he attempted to satisfy his soul and solve the problems of life by using the things of this world and adopting the philosophy of this world and leaving God out. And he tried everything that a man could possibly try. May I list some of them? He actually tried science, the science of that day, which was a good science, by the way. He tried wisdom and philosophy. He tried pleasure, and he exhausted that. He tried materialism, and he exhausted that. He cornered the gold market of the world. He tried fatalism. He tried egoism, and he tried religion. He tried wealth, and he tried actually morality of living a moral life and to see if that wouldn't satisfy him. And it may surprise you, that won't satisfy you, my friend. May I say to you that this man made the experiment, and this book records the results of each experiment. And this man is probably the only man who's ever lived who was able to make that experiment in all of its fullness. To begin with, he had the wealth of the world, and you'd need that to probe all of these fields. He had it. He could buy out Howard Hughes. That is, if he wanted to sell. And he could, uh, and also he could have bought Mr. Getty at the same time. Uh, he had the wealth to do anything he wanted to do. 
he also was king, which means there was no law that restrained him. He could go any direction he wanted to go and do anything that pleased him. And then he had the time. Those are the three things that are necessary for this experiment. And no man has ever been able to make the experiment as Solomon did. And Solomon yet in all of his glory discovered that nothing in this world could satisfy and bring happiness to his heart apart from God. This is the man under the sun and these are the results of the experiments that he made. And God's out of the picture until you get to the last chapter. And then he gives advice to a young man. To remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. And he looks back over his life, having had years and the money, the wealth, and being king, he could do anything. Looking back over his life, he looks back and he says to the young man, don't come the way I've come. The most colossal failure in Scripture is Solomon. And the reason is he had the greatest opportunity than any man ever had. He came into a kingdom that David had brought to the apex, to its zenith, and this man plunged it to the depth. May I say to you, Solomon made the experiment, and he found out, that these things of this world didn't work. Now, if you want to try them all over again, you can, but you'll never be able to do it as well as Solomon did. He had ideal condition for trying these things out. And he says here in verse 11 that God hath set the world in their hearts. The man of the world has the world set in his heart. The man of the world today looks out at this vast world in which we live. He wants wealth. He wants fame. He wants pleasure. He wants satisfaction. He wants to be uh, intelligent. He wants to move in all these different areas. And he finds out that they do not satisfy. Augustine put it like this, Thou hast made us for thyself. And our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And Augustine was a brilliant young professor in North Africa, a young professor who himself lived it up. And he did pretty well himself in living it up. And he had a praying mother by the name of Monica, and she prayed for him. And Augustine was converted, and in his book, The Confessions of St. Augustine, he tells, of a life that never brought satisfaction to him at all. Now, one of the experiments that Solomon engaged in, he adopted a philosophy of life that's known as fatalism. It's paganism in the raw. It's heathenism as it is. It finds expression in certain statements and other religions like Allah wills it. The Turks call it kismet. In India, they call it nirvana. Call it what you please. It's the same old thing. And Solomon tried it. And in the third chapter here, he tells you about it. It is fatalism. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, time to kill, time to heal, time to break down, time to build up, time to weep, time to lie, time to mourn. May I say to you, that's fatalism. That's the philosophy of fatalism. Man's a machine. That actually man is a computer, and God programs him at the beginning. And when it comes up time for him to laugh, he'll laugh. When it's time for him to weep, he'll weep. When it's time for him to go to war, he'll go to war. When it's time for him to 
till he'll kill and he can do nothing about it. That's the philosophy of fatalism. And this is the philosophy of our contemporary culture. It's pragmatic and paganistic society in which you and I live today lives by fatalism. It always disturbed me that the godless man could ride on a plane and enjoy it. And I sat there in misery. And I'll be honest with you, I used to pray to the Lord about that. I was flying up to San Francisco, and a man who heads up a large tire concern here in Southern California was on the plane, sitting right across from me. He had out all of these books that these men go over, and he was going to a meeting, and he was taking God's name in vain. You could hear him over the entire plane. He was as godless as any man I ever listened to. And I wondered, I sat there and I prayed, I said, oh God, how is it that that man is as comfortable as he can be and is as godless, and if this plane went down, he'd be lost. And it doesn't bother him a bit. I was going to San Francisco on another occasion, and that man sat next to me. And I asked him the question. I said, I seen you on this plane before, I said, uh, <clears throat> you don't seem mind flying. Oh, no, he said. I said, uh, if the plane went down, would you, you be prepared to die? He said, huh. it means nothing to me. He said this to me. He says, when your time is up, you can't do a D thing about it. So it makes no difference whether you're on the plane or off the plane. What's that? Fatalism. Last Sunday afternoon, a plane took off at the airport at Las Vegas, and before it had gotten beyond sight of the field, it plunged to the earth, and the passengers on board were killed. When word was given in the airport, a woman sat there and began to weep. She had a reservation on that plane and had canceled it. And when they came and talked to her, that wasn't the whole story. Last summer, she had a reservation on the plane that left Montreal, Canada, to go to New York City. And right before the plane took off, she canceled it. And that plane went down, and all on board were killed. And she wept in the airport. And the reporters asked her a question, are you going to stop flying? She said, of course not. When your time is up and your number comes up, that's it. That's fatalism. And my friend, that's not the Word of God. Man is a computer, according to this section here in Ecclesiastes. There's a time to be born. There is a time to die. There's a time for this and a time for that. May I say to you that there was a couple down in San Diego, a doctor and his wife. They were having a great deal of marital trouble. They went to the divorce court and got a divorce. And then they went to a computer, one of these computers that tells you who you ought to marry. And you know what that computer told them? That they were just made for each other. May I say to you, man's not a computer. Computers match them in July, and August was the month they dated. I know their marriage must be nigh. They were programmed to be automated. <clears throat> Forgive me. There was a cartoon. Two men standing before one of these great big computers. One of them was reading what it was saying. He turned to the other one and he said, it says that it doesn't need us anymore. May I say to you, friends, man is not a computer. Man is not a machine. God didn't take him at the beginning and program him 
and that there's a time for this and a time for that and a time for something else. Man's not that kind of a creature. Not at all. Psychology went through that period. When I was in school, it was behaviorism. Behaviorism, putting it very simply, was that man is a machine. You push a certain button, you'll get a certain reaction. And to a certain extent, that's true. You hit a fellow in the nose, it starts that fist of his flying. It's true that in certain areas that it works out that way. But man doesn't work according to that process at all, my beloved. And today, television runs on that type of philosophy. It's a propaganda machine. It brainwashes us. One advertisement tells us not to smoke a cigarette. The next one tells us which one to smoke. May I say to you, it's a brainwashing because they believe that man, you can push a button, he's a machine, and he'll react in a certain way. May I say to you this morning that this pessimistic and paganistic philosophy is a contradiction of the Word of God. God did not create man a machine, a computer. Man has been given a free will, and man can make decisions, and God calls upon every man to make decisions. Man's a responsible creature. The very thing he said to Adam, he says, because thou hast done this thing, it was no computer that had been programmed that way and he was just doing the thing that had been machine-like worked out. May I say to you, God says, because you've done this thing, you're responsible. Man today has been given that free will and he must make decisions in life. And somebody says, but doesn't that contradict the sovereignty of God and the election of God? Not at all. I think we forget today that God's infinite and the sovereignty and election of God's infinite, so much so you and I don't even know what it means. And I don't think Dr. Hodge knew either. And I don't think a lot of the theologians knew. I've read what they've said. And may I say to you that in the election and in the Sovereignty, Almighty God, it's so vast and wide that little man has all the free will he wants and he won't interfere with God's great program at all. May I use a very homely illustration? I was coming back from Chicago on the super cheap several years ago. It was in the summertime and there was a family on there, a very attractive family. And they were coming out here for vacation. It was their first trip. To California, and I never saw anyone enjoy a trip as this family did. There was a little boy and a little girl in the family. I imagine that they ran from one end of that train to the other a hundred times during the trip. And that means that while that train was coming from Chicago to Los Angeles, they ran back half of the time towards Chicago, but they didn't stop the train. They didn't interfere with it. Little children running against the train's not going to stop it. And my friend, little man asserting his free will, and he has all of it he wants, he'll not interfere with the program and plan of God. God is running on schedule, but you can do as you please, and God will hold you responsible. May I say to you that God gives to man a choice in certain areas. This morning, I want to mention three of them. First of all, God has given to you and me a choice that no machine could possibly make, and that is we can choose God or we can reject God. And the very interesting thing that under every dispensation, beginning in the Garden of Eden, two things have always been true. And all the dispensation means is man's appropriation of God's salvation. But the two things that are true are these. 
God has never had but one way to save mankind, and that's through the death and resurrection of Christ. And when Cain and Abel came to God, Abel brought a little lamb, and he came by faith. He came by faith looking to the coming of a Savior. And he was not saved by offering a little lamb. He was saved by faith. The writer to the Hebrews says that. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And God saved him, and he saved him because this man obeyed God. Therefore, God has only had one way of saving sinners. That's through the death and resurrection of Christ. And the second thing that's been true in every decision, uh, in every dispensation, is this, that man must make a choice. The different dispensations, it'll be different. Abel brought the little lamb. I hope you didn't bring one this morning. We don't offer them anymore because the one that that lamb was pointing to has already come, and we look now back in faith to him. And regardless of the time, you have to make a choice for God or reject him. He's made it like that. Adam had to make a choice. Cain and Abel made a choice. Noah had to make a choice. He didn't have to build that ark. Abraham was a successful merchant in the city of Ur of the Chaldeans. He had to make a choice. Joseph was down in the land of Egypt, and he could have gone the way of the Egyptians if he'd wanted to, but he'd made a choice for God. But he had to make that choice. Moses, Moses had to make a choice. And the writer to the Hebrews makes it very clear. Will you listen to what we are told here? By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses had to make a choice. Daniel had to make a choice. He and the three Hebrew children down yonder in the land of Babylon, they were given a diet that the Babylonian wise men took, and not Daniel, because he doesn't eat meat to begin with. And our translation gives a wrong impression. It says they ate pulse. Well, if I understand what pulse is, that's what they didn't eat. Pulse actually means some sort of a product that comes from grain, from either wheat or corn. Actually, what Daniel was asking for, he says that he wanted his Wheaties. That was the thing that he demanded, and he made a choice. And you'll find that he had to make that choice for God. David made a choice. He could have been a shepherd boy the rest of his life. He could have left that land when Saul was after him, but he had to make a choice. The apostles all made a choice. And if you've ever noticed how gracious our Lord was with them, he never forced them. He went by the Sea of Galilee and said, Follow me. They made a choice. And you remember on one occasion, Simon Peter went back twice. He backslid twice. And the second time, he said to the Lord Jesus, our translation says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. What he said was this, Lord, why don't you go on and let me alone? I'm such a sinner. I failed you so much. Get somebody else. And our Lord says, Come on. (laughs) He made a choice and came. You have to make a choice. You are not a computer. Paul the Apostle on the Damascus Road had to say or not say, Lord, what will you have me to do? He persecuted the church. He could have continued to persecute the church. He had to make a choice. 
And my friend, today you have to make a choice for God or you must reject him. You can't stand neutral. You are not a computer. You are not a machine. You're a man or a woman with a free will. The second area in which you and I have to make a choice, we have to choose what we'll do with our lives. You have to make that choice. You're a banker. You're a baker. You're a candlestick maker. You're a barber. Why? Why? Somewhere along the line, you made a choice. You made a choice. Joshua, when they crossed over into the land, the children of Israel had not been able to take it all, but it was there before them to take. Joshua called all the tribes together before they separated, and each one went to his particular parcel of ground He said, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. But you make up your mind. You have to make the choice. That's the reason I never use pressure in asking people to make a decision for Christ. You have to do it. If emotion is used or pressure is used, as it sometimes is, and decisions are made, they're not valid. You're doing it because everyone else is? No good. You must make a choice. Now I come to the third. Will you hear me very carefully? You choose the time of your death. Somebody says, wait a minute. The scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after death the judgment. It does say that, doesn't it? But it doesn't say it's appointed unto man once to die on a certain date at 12 o'clock. The old cliche is there's nothing sure but death and taxes. Someone else has said death is the most democratic institution on earth. And here, in this philosophy of fatalism, he says there's a time to be born and there is a time to die. But the interesting thing is, you're not a computer where you were programmed at the beginning and the date is set. You are a human being with a free will, that which makes you more like God than anything else. And my friend, this is not always true, because Paul wrote, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that's death, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. May I say to you, the rapture means that there's going to be somebody not programmed for death. And death is not always dated. Death takes a holiday. Abraham and Isaac went to the top of Mount Moriah. And Abraham lifted the naked blade of that life above the chest of his boy. And he was obeying God. And in the next second, that blade, that shining blade, would have been plunged into the heart of Isaac. He would have been dead. But God stopped him because it wasn't going to be permitted at that time. God spared not his own son, but he did spare Abraham's son. The children of Israel had sinned in their rebellion against God in the wilderness, and they were dying in the judgment of God just like flies. 
And Moses put up a serpent of brass, and they could look and live. And many looked and lived, and others did not. There was no date there, my friend. Ahab had invited Jehoshaphat, his his daughter had married the son of Jehoshaphat, invited him to go to war against the Syrians. And Jehoshaphat was reluctant to go because he felt like those prophets of Baal were not giving accurate information. He said, isn't there a prophet of God here? He said, yes, but I keep him in jail. Well, he said, let's bring him out and see what he has to say. And they brought out Micaiah. The guard who went to get Micaiah says, now look, if you want to get in with the king, they're all telling him to go to this battle. Micaiah came in and he joined in the parade, didn't say a word. He just went around and around with the prophets of Baal in a very sarcastic manner. And Ahab says, look, I know you're just playing. Tell me, should I go to the battle? And so this man, Micaiah, told him, if you go to the battle, you will be killed. You can save your life if you'll not go. And Ahab turned to Jehoshaphat and says, see, he never tells me anything good. He says, I'll be killed. He went into the battle, paid no attention to Micaiah. When he left, he says, put this man back in prison, feed him on bread and water, and when I get back, I'll take care of him. And Micaiah had the last word. He says, if you come back, the Lord hasn't spoken by me. Ahab didn't come back because the record says there was a trigger-happy soldier on the other side who, when the battle had apparently come to an end, he had one arrow left in his quiver. He reached back to get it, and he said, i got to shoot it. And he pulled the bow back and let it go. And the Word of God says it was a bow at a venture. There was no target except Ahab. And that arrow went around and found Ahab. May I say to you, he didn't come back. He could have changed the day of his death. The one I'm thinking of in particular this morning is Hezekiah, the king. Isaiah came to Hezekiah and said, Set your house in order, you're ready to die. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and cried out to God. And God sent Isaiah back to tell him, I've heard your prayer, I will extend your life 15 years and to prove it that the shadow will go back on the sundial. It'll go back two degrees, 45 minutes, and I'll extend your life 15 years. Now I used to say, and I'll have to say it today because I've written it in my book on Isaiah, Hezekiah made a tremendous mistake of asking his life to be extended because it was during that time Manasseh was born. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. He was born after that 15-year period began. And he was the worst king that ever sat on the throne. It was during that period that that man opened up the treasures and let the ambassadors from Babylon see it and when the king of Babylon needed gold to carry on the war, he knew where to get it. The ambassadors had brought back the message. And one day the armies of Babylon were camped outside the walls of Jerusalem. Hezekiah made a terrible, terrible mistake, maybe. I used to say that. But I thank God he extended his life 15 years. Why? Because man is not a computer Man is not a machine. A very fine preacher who's a personal friend of mine, but he has a way of making artificial divisions of the Scripture. He has written a little book in which he talks about dying grace, and there's no such thing, may I say, as that. Dwight L. Moody was once asked the question, do you have grace to die? He says, no, I don't. 
He says, but I think when the time comes, I will. But this man who has written this book, and he gives one basis or one instance of dying grace as the 23rd Psalm, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And may I say to you that that doesn't mean that that's when you come to the end of your life. Actually, it means the beginning of your life. That's the picture of man at the very beginning. That's the picture of every person here. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the minute that you're born, you start down through that valley. And you never know. You never know. Because you're not a computer. And it's not programmed in there. It can be changed. It is changed. It has been changed. And David says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and if someone says the moment that gives us life begins immediately to take it away from us, and down through the valley we go, all the way through life. And that's what he's talking about. I want to come back today to where I was last Lord's Day, and I trust you'll forgive me. There's a reason. Paul, the apostle, had his life extended on several occasions. And one of those he mentions in 2 Corinthians 1.9. He says, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. And Paul says now, who delivered us from so great a death? He evidently had been sick. And he doth deliver. That was for the present. And then he said, In whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. There's none of this arrogance today that I hear coming from some quarters about you can demand God to do something. You don't demand him to do anything. Even the apostle Paul, who had the gifts of an apostle, did not use them. Paul said, I'm walking softly. We trust that he will yet deliver us. I'm trusting him. Now, will you listen? The next verse says, Ye also helping together by prayer for us. The church prayed. And we know now, when Paul wrote this, he didn't know it, but we know now that God heard and answered the prayer of the church. And the church in Corinth rejoiced when they saw Paul again. My beloved, may I say to you that death is not dated. Death can take a holiday. That it's never sure. This man Paul had the sentence of death in him and the church prayed and God heard the prayer and raised him up. I'll be personal and be through. I speak this morning as a desperate man. Last Thursday night, we had probably 65 people for the prayer group, practically none of the leadership of this church. Either today we do not believe in prayer or else you do not care whether the pastor lives or dies. Will you pray? Do you believe God hears and answers prayer? I am convinced that God wants to hear and answer. God is gracious. He is good. He wants to hear. And I don't want to be ugly. I want to be kind. But my friend, we'll have to lay hold of him. He wants to be good and kind. It was Sir James Simpson, the great Scotch surgeon, who actually introduced chloroform for operations. 
he uh, was a great physician. He did not discover it. It was discovered by a French physician brought to Scotland. And this man began the first use of it. And a cry went up, not only in Scotland, but all over the world, by Christians saying that he had no right to use chloroform, that God intended man to suffer, and God intended man to go through the pain. And Sir James Simpson was a, a wonderful Christian. He had a very tender heart. And he didn't want to do anything contrary to the will or word of God. So he went off and took the Bible and he said, I want to find out whether it's all right for me to use chloroform and make it so that people can be operated on without going through pain. And he found this passage of scripture. When God took the rib out of Adam and made the woman he put Adam in a deep sleep. God was good and gracious. God wants to hear and answer our prayer. Do we believe? Shall we pray? Oh God, we thank thee that Thou hast made us, and Thou hast not made us a machine. Thou hast not made us a computer, and that everything is already arranged. Oh, God, we do pray that we may see that Thou dost call upon us to make decisions, that there's a choice for each one of us to make. And that prayer today would indeed be what the, what the atheist said it was, a fool talking to himself if we were just a machine. But thank God thou wilt hear and thou wilt answer prayer. Give us that kind of faith and cause us to look to thee in a new and real and believing way. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.